always been accused of having their heads in the clouds, whereas the uh, historians are about concrete things. But as I was listening to the talks last night and this morning, I realized you're being presented with the philosophy of history by a historian. And so I feel very comfortable as a philosopher jumping in to a discussion about the philosophy of history. And uh, you, saw, you saw earlier the ages that were presented in different ways of doing history. But one of the things that they all have in common is they all involve humans, right? We're doing history about humans. Now, you could have humans that do history about non-human things. It's usually maybe called something else then, right? Like natural history or something. But we're normally doing history about humans. And in all of those different ages or different generations, humans have something in common, which is they want to understand. They want to find meaning. And so I'm going to be talking about that today. And I'm actually going to start with a prophecy. Does that surprise you from a philosopher? That would be a good story at lunch. They can ask you, which one did you go to? Oh, I went to one where I heard a sun devil give a prophecy. <laughs> so uh, they can't say that at a U of A. It's not the same if you say a wildcat gave a prophecy. A sun devil gave a prophecy. And it's actually a prophecy by another philosopher. So I feel safe uh, in giving what is the Socratic prophecy. Socrates said this toward the end of the Apology. And now, O men who have condemned me, I would fain prophesy to you, for I am about to die, and that is the hour in which men are fitted with prophetic power. Me you have killed because you want to escape the accuser, and not to give an account of your lives. But that will not be as you suppose, for I say that there will be more accusers of you than there are now, accusers whom hitherto have I have restrained, and as they are younger, they will be more severe with you and you will be more offended at them. So here's a Socratic prophecy, which I think applies to all of us involved in teaching. Those he's speaking to were not able to give an account of their lives. And the prophecy is that their students will not accept this and will be much more severe with them than Socrates was. To give an account is the purpose of the academy in any of the disciplines. They're all sharing that. This connects us to the word logos, which is, we still find this in some of the disciplines of the academy, right? The geologos, the geology, the biologos, the astrologos. No, no, they, the superstitious uh, got that. We do astronomy. We had to get astronomy uh, instead. The word history doesn't have that connection to the Greek word logos, but it does still have uh, the same purpose, to give an account of human life and how humans have lived the beliefs that have shaped their choices, to find meaning in that and teach that meaning to our students. If we cannot give such an account, then the Socratic prophecy will apply to us. And this is the account he's given himself at the end of his apologos. Are we able to find meaning, the meaning that is in history? I think that's what we'd find uniting each of the different kinds of approaches. They are, nevertheless, trying to find meaning. There's a self-referential nature to saying something like, don't give a universal philosophy of history because here's what history is, right? So even the postmodernists are involved in telling us what they think history is about. You focus too much on general rules, let's get to the particulars. Well, that has a self-referential problem if you make that then into a rule. But the thing that's a thread, the thing that's common for all of them is this desire to find meaning. And to find meaning is, is the search for understanding. And we're especially looking in history to, to understand change. So we study the choices that people have made, and these tell us about their values and the beliefs that inform them. And that's where we begin to get to the uniqueness of human nature in having beliefs and pursuing understanding. And values and therefore beliefs are often in conflict. So an individual person can have this conflict in themselves and read about that kind of thing in biographies. And people groups can be in conflict. History is the study of conflict, but not simply conflict, because you could maybe study the history of uh, crabs on the seafloor going to war. When we get to humans, we're especially studying the outworking of basic beliefs in conflict. And I have an outline I'm going to use here. And I'll be referencing some of my work in my book, The Declaration of Independence and God, Self-Evident Truths in American Law. So history has, human history has that special feature. We especially get to how humans have understand th understood things, the study of how people have attempted to find meaning in their lives. We don't simply want to study experiences, but the, the meaning of those experiences. It's not a catalog of mere experiences. 
This gets us to the beliefs used to give meaning and how a person understands their own experiences. So I, I'll call these basic beliefs here because they're the beliefs that under, undergird all the rest of a person's thinking. When basic beliefs are challenged and when they fail to provide meaning, they do not last. As we identify these beliefs and how they shape institutions and cultures and motivate the changes that we see over time, we're bringing history to life. We're giving it meaning for ourselves and for our students. That gets past the, simply the critique that it's a bunch of dates and names. Well, it does involve those things. And why? Why are they meaningful? So why do we study history? We, we can see, and we, we've seen in the talk so far, there are different ways to study history. You could do the history of ideas, the history of battles, the history of culture, storytelling. You could use it to learn lessons from our errors. And there's many more, right? But underlying all of these is history as conflict between basic beliefs. This is what motivates changes. It is beliefs that motivate and shape choices. And so this will underline any other approach. Any approach you get from a historian about what history is, well, it's going to evolve that historian's beliefs, isn't it? So we can't escape the role of beliefs when we're studying humans and human nature. Part of the study is simply raising our consciousness and our students' consciousness about those. So they are able to identify them. They come to know themselves, is another Socratic dictum. Do you know your own basic beliefs? How you've uh, thought about the world and, and maybe you want to rethink those now that you're aware of them. We use these uh, beliefs to find meaning in our lives. We can see how civilizations have been built on basic beliefs. That might be kind of the biggest unit in history, civilizations, down to the smallest unit, the individual. And many civilizations have decayed because they lacked meaning. Only that which retains meaning will last. So do we have meaning? Seems like a fair question to ask our students. Or are we in a process of decay? So now, permit me to use an example from my book that connects that question to our current context from the Declaration of Independence and God. I've always been intrigued by the philosophical aspects of the famous statement, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. But among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It stood out to me that this is a government document. Can you imagine getting a government document like that, like a letter from the IRS that has those things in it? It's a secular document. It's not, it's not from a certain Christian denomination, for example, even if there's a lot of historical work trying to, to, to trace the different founders' denominations. It's a secular document, and it's ground, it grounds its arguments and claims about the nature of God and man. It's an example of natural religion. It is giving us answers to the questions, what is real? What has existed from eternity and what determines human nature? And these are the areas in philosophy of epistemology, metaphysics, and ethics. And we get this great unifying statement where we see the relationship between all three of those fields. And the statement also tries to tell us why. It answers the questions, how do we know? Well, it says these truths about God are self-evident. And now this is a problematic answer. And I'll come to that in some more detail later, but these answers aren't actually self-evident in the way that logical truths are self-evident. So perhaps it's more that they're common ground for the rest of what will proceed in their argument. And we can recognize a structure here. Arguments about rights or values rest on beliefs about what is real, God, human nature. And these in turn will rely on a theory of knowledge. Well, how do you know that about God or human nature? It gives us the order of epistemology, theory of knowledge, to metaphysics, what is real, to ethics, what is good? How do I know what is real, what ought I to do? But did it sufficiently establish these foundational answers? The centuries since that time have seen challenges raised at these points, and for many, those beliefs are no longer meaningful at all. Take an example from Thomas Paine. He challenged the meaningfulness of belief in God. Here he is at the, at the time of the Declaration of Independence voicing challenges that we still hear today from those who are called the new atheists. He did higher, I always point this out, he did higher criticism way before the 19th century. We look at the New Testament, his, his work on the New Testament. Paine argues that we can know there's a first cause, but that's about all. This shows the problem and the ambiguity of the Declaration of Independence. What is meant by God the Creator? What is the meaning of this term? And has it been emptying of meaning since that time so that it maybe at best it's a first cause and maybe not even that? Can we know what is eternal? Can we know God? And those questions are right there for us if we study that and we think about American history since that time. 
So the study of history begins with learning to identify basic beliefs, and I'm going to especially focus on the belief about the good. That falls in the third one, the ethics portion. But it unifies the others. You can learn a lot about a person by knowing what they think is the good. That's their highest value. The summum bonum. That which they pursue above all else for its own sake. Once you know what a person's view of the good is, you'll learn a lot about what they think is real, about human nature, about how they know. So the Declaration of Independence gives us that framework. This can account for, uh, as I said, much of human history after that time and the challenges that have been raised in American history, especially thinking about the challenges about human nature. But behind that are views and beliefs about what God is like. Theists, God the creator and redeemer. Deists, transcendentalists. That's a good one. You go home and say, I'm a transcendentalist now. So our students could be introduced to these ideas. If we did history and we didn't introduce our students to these basic ideas, and we didn't help them wrestle through their own answers to these, then we wouldn't have brought history to life for them. So how does this help us study changes in history? You might say, well, that's one document, Anderson. Well, let me give an example from another one of my books, uh, Reason and Faith at Early Princeton. How do you understand changes in an institution over time and, and do these reflect, you can then ask, do these reflect other changes in American education and culture? Princeton was founded, this might surprise you, I'm curious to see if it does. I was able to hold a seminar there and I asked the students this question, did you come to Princeton for this reason? Princeton was founded for the purpose of teaching piety and the knowledge of God. I know that's why they come to ASU, but is that why they go to Princeton? <laughs> now that's not its goal now. And so part of the change, part of the history of studying Princeton is why did that change? The current goal, I double checked this on their website, the current president says, our unofficial motto is service to nation and humanity. Notice the shift, piety and the knowledge of God to humanism, humanity. So piety, part of studying the history of that would be what happened? Well, challenges were raised between the first great awakening and now a number of challenges were raised to the very idea of God at all. And what is piety? I don't know if that's even a term people use. And in classical education, who do you think of when I say piety? Sum pius anius, right? But he was pious towards an idol, a false god. So piety in itself is not a good. Piety has to be directed at truth. And that's why Princeton aimed piety and the knowledge of God. Truth. So the challenges. The changes at Princeton were brought about by exposing uh, a lack of meaning in those beliefs. That's both objectively and subjectively the case. It could be that subjectively they think they have no meaning when they do. And in history, that's one of the more important pieces, because then they turn away from it, even if there is meaning there. Now, James Madison, a Princeton grad, said that he didn't think we really need theistic arguments. And instead, he emphasized something called common sense. William Tennant Sr., the founder of Princeton and one of the persons involved in the First Great Awakening, said something similar about common sense. That's what's important to the Christian life. And so you have assertions then about God and, and a de-emphasis on giving any proof. What's going to happen in the next generation? Do they like to be told things without proof? Do this. Believe in God. Well, why? Maybe there isn't a God. Now, I'm not up here right now. I'm not doing, I'm teaching a philosophy religion class right now where we're looking at the theistic arguments. Now we're not going to settle the matter, so to speak, but raise it as a reality, right? Should we, does that belief have any meaning for the next generation and the next generation if there isn't any proof? Now, the founders of the country are focused on this worldly goods in the Declaration of Independence and providing a stable framework for pursuing those goods. God is needed as a source of equality, which gives rights. But not much more is used, God is used for in that sentence. So Thomas Jefferson and James Madison have their own personal beliefs in religion, different denominations. But they still agree on the secular framework. And this is one point that Madison made about the reality of factions. There will always be factions, he said. And a framework is needed for keeping them from having one of them oppress the others. This is a kind of skepticism about our ability to come to agreement on what divides us into factions. So before the postmodernism we heard about earlier, we have this skepticism, a form of what's called academic skepticism, already present in the heart of what they was termed the modern age. We can't know. There will always be denominations, religions, and they always fight with each other. 
We don't really know the answer. See how that's skepticism? And then if you're in the position of telling the next generation you have to accept these beliefs, even though we can't really know, the general tendency of the next generation is to say, no, I'm not going to do it. I'll do my own thing. So this is part of studying change in history over time. Challenge to beliefs and helping our students see that same meaning. I suspect st your students have beliefs about these things, have been told things by their parents, and have questions of their own about them. Now you might think, hey, he's just auditioning to have a philosopher in K through 12. Yes, uh, absolutely, we need more philosophers in K through 12. So we can see how change works out in these kinds of conflicts, and then from there, we can look and see how it affects it, it, change at those levels of meaning, affect institutions, affect people's lives, affect individual choices. We don't simply want truth as we study history. That was brought up earlier. Is this true? Yes and no. Well, it's because you're looking at truths, the many true things. We want the truth, the definite article, the. What is true, especially about what is real, permanent, unchanging, eternal. This truth connects the many truths and helps us make sense of them. So you can begin to see why that structure of the Declaration of Independence is so important. Not just beliefs randomly organized. We want the, the relationship between beliefs. We call that either a system or a worldview. Beliefs come together. That's what the Declaration of Independence helps us uh, illustrate. And so when we teach uh, critical thinking, we're teaching critical thinking of worldviews as they're worked out in history between people. And when you look at any given conflict, some people like to do history as battles. Well, guess what? If it's battles between humans, it's because they have different beliefs about things. And they're arguing about that. Are we able to help our students understand why? One of the views of uh, the modern is always a kind of snobbery that we've figured it out. And in the old days, they were really dumb. And so wars back then were just because they weren't very smart. And now we know not to fight about religion. right? And so we have to help students overcome this sort of view of the past. I'm going to look again to Socrates as an example. There are many different versions of Socrates, and he might be used simply as an example of questions, but with the idea that we never actually come to know. And even when we think of the kinds of questions he asked, there could be different levels of questions. Not every Socratic question is equal. Some are more basic than others. But there's another version of Socrates as pursuing knowledge of the good, which I think is the essential version. So that acknowledging that he does not know is the first and necessary step in pursuing knowledge of the good. It's not a final step. Some people present him as the final skeptic. And his own, his own the, the academy degraded into the academic skeptics. Uh, but no, he's starting that. That's the starting place. I don't know what is good, and I should know what is good. So I'm looking to him as an example of critical thinking about basic beliefs, an example of how to do history. Do we know how to pursue that question and think about the ways that historical persons, I remember that there was a picture of the different books that are used of famous people. I'd like to know that, what each of them thought was good. What was their highest good? Or if you were looking at battles. Yeah, what, are, what is being fought about here? What can be brought to life for the students? So Socrates ended his defense with this prophecy I mentioned earlier. He said he was on trial because he'd shown that they could not give an account of their lives. And that although he would be killed, these others would come after him. The youth who would say, okay, boomer. Okay, Socrates. No, they would say, okay, sophists. You provided us with no knowledge or meaning. And that was the only inheritance we'd hoped from you. And so they're going to be more severe with them. So this question can't be avoided as we do history. We're doing history of humans, human nature, involved in wanting to know meaning. We can't avoid that. The only solution... Socrates says, is to improve ourselves by coming to know the answer. Be able to give an account of yourself. Be able to give an account of uh, history to your students. History is full of meaning. So the questions that I've identified in this talk, in the Declaration of Independence, we can see uh, similar kinds of questions being answered in the institution of Princeton. And I should say, I didn't go to Princeton, and I don't have any family members that went there. I'm just hoping my kids get to go there if I keep talking positively about it. So we saw them challenged, moving from piety and knowledge of God to humanism. Are we able to 
help our students understand those kinds of change. That might be a very specific change you never thought of studying yourself, but whatever you're studying in history will share those similarities in its place. And so we can continue, we can end with that Socratic prophecy. This is what we will be judged on. Do we help our students find meaning and give an account of themselves? Thank you.